You're listening to the Work Cultured Podcast, where good companies keep good company. Well, hey, we've got Tom Kylie on the show today. He is the CEO of Source Day out of Austin, Texas. Uh, he's a co-founder, started it a little over six years ago. Tom, welcome to Work Cultured. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and excited to, to speak with you today. Awesome. Well, we have a few questions. We'll just go ahead and dive right in. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about Source Day. I uh, appreciate the opportunity and excited to be here today. Um, yeah, so long, long journey, try to keep it as short as possible. But uh, <laughs> uh, my background was really from degree at Texas A&M in supply chain and manufacturing and logistics and uh, quickly went into a career at Dell after school and learned a lot firsthand of some of the real world challenges in manufacturing and supply chain that, that existed, even some of the largest companies. Um, you know, that, that are even some of the most efficient companies as well. Um, fast forward, I started my first software company, bootstrapped it in 2008 and operated and ran and built that as kind of a, you know, nights and weekends type job. Never really got to be a full-time thing for me, but I learned a lot about how not to build a company with my own money. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, as my wife would say, I, I uh, made some expensive mistakes and learned a lot of lessons, but uh, fast forward in 2013, I met my co-founder, Clint McCree. Uh, he ran a manufacturing company for 10 years here in the Austin, Texas area and also experienced some of the firsthand pains. And, you know, using his kind of vision and early thought process around how to create a better supply chain, uh, he and I came together in late, mid to late 2015. We launched today what is now known as Source Day. That's awesome. And so you've been at about six years then, uh, a little over. Yeah, it feel, feels like uh, maybe 10, but yeah, I think uh, we spent, we spent yeah. two years behind the scenes, again, nights and weekends, um, you know, from the hours of 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. working with our development Ooh. team in Bangladesh. Wow. Well, then, of course, was the, the time vortex of COVID. So that, that two years, <laughs> I'm sure, felt like two months or six years. If one of the, but pro probably longer, maybe 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll edit this part out, but I also just realized that I didn't even introduce ourselves. I'm Jason, and this is Daniel. <laughs> Sometimes we forget. I, it's all about you, Tom. You know, we don't uh, we no. don't matter. We're just here to ask you good questions. Hopefully, <laughs> I figured as much. I, I, yeah, I, well, I, I recognize your names. Tom. Well, good. That's that is definitely a good thing. I, I know that as I was kind of researching Source Day, and and I spent a few years in sales in logistics. And you guys, in such a short amount of time, have kind of amassed a good deal of recognition as, as a company from a number of different sources. I mean, do you have maybe some, some uh, favorites that you've, you've been recognized or some things that you feel like stand out to you that kind of proudest moments on this journey to, to, to this point? Yeah, there's, you know, I, I'd tell you, you know, everything's been a really a team accomplishment and, um, you know, it's kind of hard to pinpoint any one. There's probably a handful. I think, we, you know, we were recognized in the Austin Gives, uh, you know, I think two years ago or so, roughly. Um, so the Austin Gives Award and then also in the Inc. Um, fastest growing companies uh, actually published that. in the magazine, which just felt like a very surreal moment. And then, um, you know, we've received the Austin A-List award as well. Um, so I think it's just, you know, some of those are more local uh, than, than national. But uh, for me, it's, you know, being able to recognize the hard work that our team does, because uh, what we do as early stage, you know, disruptive startup companies, it's, it's never easy. And it's uh, a lot of hours and a lot of trial by fire. And, um, you know, some, sometimes we, we don't make the right decision the first time. So it's just, you know, rinse and repeat and iterate. So. Yeah, absolutely. We, we have a lot of questions about that growth. I mean, this has been a, a journey. You're, you're well over 100 employees now, correct? Correct. Yeah, we just yeah. surpassed 100 earlier this year. And I think when COVID hit, we were we were just about 45 people. So we've had some great growth. Oh, wow. So, so the, a lot of the expansion has been recent. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And we've been very fortunate uh, through the through these, you know, tragic times to to really, you know, be able to grow as much as we have. Yeah. Uh, I did want to ask one question. So before we get too much into the asking you about your culture uh, and, and all the things that you've built there with the, the people strategy, uh, there's one question we ask every guest uh, and we, we kind of put you on the spot. Uh, what is a mistake that you've made in leadership that you'll never forget? Just just one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, hard, it's hard to narrow down. What, what's one that comes to mind? Yeah. No, that's a great question, right? And I think um, I, I've obviously made many mistakes, uh, sometimes multiple in a single day. Um, <laughs> Same. <laughs> but I think, you know, one, one of my earlier bigger challenges was really as we were growing the business, um, you know, Clint and I used to do every role other than writing code, which I think I wrote maybe like two lines of code and then they, they told me to go away. Um, but, but and, and rightfully so. Um, you know, but I, I think as we grew, we started hiring, you know, people for point positions, leadership and, and others uh, that were more capable, more experienced and, and really more creative in those roles. And coming from having done that role, right, for one, two, three, four years, however long it took to hire the person to come really own it. Uh, it was hard for me. I think I made a lot of mistakes early on hired great people and great leaders and didn't enable or entrust them to, to take over responsibility and do things their way and, and take their experiences that we hired them for uh, to really own and adapt and change and improve upon what we were doing uh, as a dedicated team or as a dedicated leader. Um, so that, you know, that can slow, you know, growth down. So I, I had a hard time letting go, a hard time transitioning and, and, uh, you know, sometimes when it's your baby, you really, you know, you don't want to trust anyone. But I think I learned some valuable lessons in that, you know, w when you hire great people, you, you have to trust that you hired the right person and, and, yeah. and let go and give them the ownership to, to really make mistakes and also improve upon what we've done. Yeah, love that. that. That's good stuff. Yeah, thank you for the for answering. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, picking just one could be difficult. <laughs> yeah, uh, especially several. early on. We could talk all yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, and they don't—they don't seem to stop either. It just seems to to be um, trial by fire and 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 hitting road bumps along the way. Um, I'm curious uh, around that. As you hire people now for key roles, what are some of the coping mechanisms? Is is it just learned experience, or do you have you? Um, like learn something specific that you implement to, to be like, okay, I'm definitely going to give this person the reins. I'm going to trust them right out of the gate. Yeah, I think, you know, defining a role, right? So defining a role is critical and in, in, in doing that before you start the interview process. Um, that enables you to make sure that you've hired the right person and that the, the criteria that that role is going to own, the, the objectives and key results that they're going to own must be very explicit and, and aligned to the business goals. And if, if you set those, you know, role definitions in advance, you can hire the person to meet all or most of those criteria and then really hand over that process. And I've had an executive coach uh, for several years now, and he helped uh, our organization put in what we call the growth playbook out of his kind of uh, coaching playbook. And that growth playbook really helps us stay aligned as a leadership team. And, and as we insert a new leader, um, just this week, we brought in our first ever and, and new chief product officer. Um, but we've oh, wow. always had objectives and key results around product. We've never had a you know single leader. Uh, we had uh, you know a leader that was owning that and several other things. So, um, you know, we were able to insert him into here's what we've been doing and, and here's how we've been monitoring and tracking and, and looking at metrics. Uh, and then and then he would come in and now insert you know what what he thinks we need to add to that or change from that. But uh, defining a role is probably the most critical piece to hiring any any person in any role. Yeah, I mean, and you're you're able to not just define it for yourself, but then transfer that to whoever it is you hire, so they know what is expected of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you mentioned you know finding the right person, and, and we even chatted about that via uh, email. Um, you know, right person, right seat. You know, Jim Collins and all these other people talk about right person, right seat, and you know, you guys, you know, still pretty early young company, but you have, you got that round C of funding, which is, seems like a pretty significant amount. And you have more than doubled in size over the last, what, two years? 
Is that right? We have. Yeah, I think we've we've tripled uh, in the last two years. Tripled. Um, wow. And and you know finding the right talent is is critical. I think you could have the best idea in the world and the biggest market opportunity to go tackle and uh, the best partners, the you know best everything. But if you don't have the right people to go execute a, against that plan and that strategy and and really you know bring accountability to a role. Um, then everything kind of falls apart. So we put a great emphasis on making sure, you know, we're very diligent in our interview process. We have several key leadership and mid-level managers and other team members that get involved in every hire uh, to make sure that, A, there's a great culture fit because bad culture fit can be toxic and really erode the value of a company. And then also make sure that they're going to bring, you know, something new and, and challenging to the role that is going to make us think differently about how we were previously. Yeah, no, so there's a lot of this uh, debate about the idea of culture fit, and I think it's just because a lot of organizations define that differently. Um, you know, some people, you know, the culture fit idea is, oh, let's just hire a bunch of people that are like us that we like. Um, but I think a lot of leaders think very differently about it, and some, I, you know, it's a semantics issue sometimes, but it, it's a real issue other times. And I'm curious. So when you talk about a culture fit, uh, you specifically, what do you mean? Yeah, I think I mean the exact opposite of, of kind of what, what you just kind of uh, described. It's I don't want to find uh, lookalikes or identical matches to you know existing members of the team. I want to continually challenge us to uh, get outside of our comfort zone and, and to hire people that have you know diverse backgrounds and diverse ways of looking at solving problems. Um, you know, she might kill me for saying this, but I'd say you know our CMO uh, Sarah Scudder, who joined back in October of last year. Um, is exactly what I was looking for in our CMO. She's bold, she's creative, she brings some personal touches into her marketing and, and, and her social posts and how she interacts with prospects and customers and, and really our target industry. And she really takes it to kind of more of a, you know, bridging that, we know what COVID did, which is bridging kind of that personal work life uh, to, to make it more humanized. So I'd say, you know, that took a lot of people in our leadership team out of their comfort zone. And, and she, she does a lot of, you know, posting of, you know, fun, crazy pictures that are unique and uh, out there. But, you know, it engages with our audience and it makes them excited about, you know, the technology we're delivering and the problems we're solving for our customers. And it's, it's just more than anything, it's different. Um, and I think that makes people uncomfortable. But I also think that's what is necessary when, when you're, you know, disrupting something so large as a supply chain. Yeah. And, and so, so you know, the, the CMO in particular, how did you know that she would be that culture fit? How did you know that she would kind of balance and, and, and even push the envelope of what you, you know, the, your existing team was already used to? How did you figure that out? Yeah, I'm curious yeah, that about one the was, process on how you determine that. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so that one was probably easier than most just because marketing is so, um, you know, public, right? Everything that they do is out there, right? Most of their work product is, you know, on the website and social media on LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, other channels, right, that, that are used. Um, so you can really see that person's style and how they create and how they disrupt. Um, so her, you know, hers was, you know, very unique in that she had a personal brand. She came from a career of, you know, supply chain and procurement and sourcing. So it was, you know, it was already, you know, she had over 13,000 or so followers that are, you know, um, relevant to us and our audience. So it was, you know, we really hired a brand ambassador and, and somebody that really had passion for the industry and the problems that we solve. And so it, that one was probably it, it, too easy. Um, it gets much harder when you get into other roles like, you know, CTOs and chief product officers, and uh, you have to kind of back channel. So some of the things that I always make sure I do is, uh, you know, you have to be as creative as possible when you're back channeling. But I, I go and dig deep through people's networks and find the connections of connections and speak to them several times before I make a decision to hire, especially at a leadership role. Um, yeah. I, I always back channel several contacts within their, their, uh, their background and their network. Yeah, you're digging deep. You're doing the, the research. It's too so, important not to. Mm -hmm. No, totally. And I guess my curiosity would then be as you all continue to scale and you hit bigger milestones, 250, 500 employees, are you, is that still the goal to, to do it that way? Or do you all envision having to kind of add some, some 
processes or, or some, some new way to do that um, kind of back channeling there? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does get very manual. Um, yeah. You know, I think we 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 do. You know, oddly enough, right to the, to this day, we still don't have a dedicated in-house recruiter or sourcing uh, wow. role. Um, we're we've been very fortunate to primarily use our employees' referrals. We we give a high referral fee yeah, to our team members to you know use and be creative within their networks to help us hire. Um, we've also had to use outsource firms and, and others for specific roles, but I'd say sure. a lot of times if you use a firm, right, they'll, they'll do back channeling and, and, um, you know, those calls for you. So at scale that works, but it's very expensive. Um, yeah, yeah. so I think, you know, back channeling works really well. If you're referring, getting a referral from an existing employee that's in good standing, then great. You don't really have to do much back channeling. Um, so I think at scale, um, the referrals work the best. Um, and then beyond that, right, it, it's up, you know, the leadership team, I train and, and teach and coach leadership team to be very aggressive with back channeling just the same way I do when I hire leaders uh, to make sure that, you know, each mid-level director and, and VP that, that is hiring roles, that they're doing that back channeling on their own as well. So you just have to kind of push it throughout the organization. Yeah, it's tough to scale. Your specific intuition and methodology it, it you, you you can't scale too far right you, you have your immediate team and then you have to kind of give them the process that's worked so well for you yeah and that's where hiring great people you know and, and again going back to my trust issue early on right where i you know had to let go um, and i've obviously become much 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 better at that you know i've Again, the product leader that just started last Monday, um, I basically said, "Here's what we've been doing. Here's kind of our, you know, you know, next 18 months roadmap. Now you go own it and, and come back and tell us what what you think we should change or do differently." And and I just step aside, right, and say, you know, answer questions, keep alignment on strategy and, and goals, and you know what what the board and, and the expectations are from you know those team members, um, and and then let them you know step aside and do their role, but. Um, it's absolutely critical, I think, hiring the right people and, and then enabling them to go, you know, quite frankly, make mistakes, you know, because sometimes yeah. mistakes will be made and, and we'll learn from those and then we'll move on. Yeah, so that gets a little bit more into some, some of the, uh, the feel uh, of the culture you built. I mean, you know, I, I took a screenshot of all of the awards that you guys have had of you know, best places to work and everything else. Like it, it, it's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, <laughs> And you, know, you just hit on something that it seems to be uh, finally becoming just, I guess, more present in everyone's mind share, which is like letting people fail. So, so tell me, what, what are some of your secrets for creating that environment where people feel comfortable taking risks and also when they do make a mistake, bringing it to you, not shoving it under the rug or hiding it, pretending like it didn't happen. But celebrating it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, lo I love that. And so one of the things that I, I say in, in all of my interviews with uh, candidates and when we hire people and even when we do like a new hire orientation, um, it, I, I'm quoted saying this probably too often and obnoxiously, but, um, <laughs> you know, if, if you're not breaking something in the organization, then you're probably not trying hard enough to improve what it, whatever it is you're working on, whether it's a product or you know a new marketing campaign or sales outreach or a customer QBR right if if we're continually just doing things the way we've always done them and being complacent then you know we're we're just not getting better and we're not improving and so I I I absolutely encourage you know don't be afraid to break something but make sure you break something that we can fix um, cuz <laughs> That, that, that is a caveat, but we've, we have broken some things pretty hard before and trying to improve something and, you know, we, we learn from it and, um, improve from it and, and then, you know, iterate and fix and repair and go forward. But I, I think, you know, if, if you're co collaborative and communicative with, with everyone in the organization that it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to break things as long as we're transparent about it, right? Brushing it under the rug is just going to, you know, make that worse and, and just exacerbate the problem. So, we don't, you know, shame people. We don't punish people for making mistakes. We celebrate it, like you said, and uh, make sure that that kind of becomes a documented, you know, all right, that's that's not how we should have done it, and what could we have done differently? What can we learn from that? Um, and, and I think if you continually drive that culture of don't be afraid to make mistakes, in fact, maybe celebrate mistakes, because that means you're innovating and, and you're trying to go forward in a path that's been uncharted before. 
Um, so I absolutely am a big proponent of breaking things, um, but making sure it's something that you can actually fix um, for one yeah. thing. Now, did I read right? Are you guys, are y'all back in the office kind of on a hybrid office work from home setup right now? We, we are. Um, so, you know, we've, I've actually uh, been in the office in the Austin uh, office for two years, uh, a little over two years now with several other of my you know, leadership team and others uh, voluntarily just decided to come back uh, back in mm -hmm. July of 2020. Uh, I've got three young kids and love them to death, but uh, it, it's really hard to, to focus as much as you need to with, with them running around. And that's me personally. Some people can do that better than others. Um, so, you know, we have uh, over the last two years slowly started bringing people back. Some roles were coming back, you know, w one day a week as leadership type roles, you know, mid-level leadership. Um, the, the executive leadership team has been in four to five days a week for the past two years. Um, and, and now just recently we've started to bring back team members three days a week. Uh, so having more of a hybrid model. And, you know, while that may be unpopular to some people because, you know, there's no reason, you know, remote doesn't work for some organizations as, as it's just a stance. Um, but, but I do believe for the speed at which, you know, startups and high di highly disruptive, innovative, you know, cr creative uh, organizations that startups are, uh, it, it, it does become harder to go as fast as we want to go on decision velocity and, you know, problem solving and taking care of customers if, if you're doing it just over Zoom 24-7. Uh, and I think it also what, what just... What do you think is the X factor there? What, what do you think is the difference that, that it, the energy that being in the office brings? Yeah, and, you know, we were always, you know, pre-COVID, we were always in an office culture. We, you know, we've, we've, we're in, I think, our fourth office space now, and we, we started literally in a warehouse, the 16-foot garage bay door. We had to install our own AC unit. Um, oh I actually installed the kitchen myself. Um, you nice. know, we, we, we just always, you know, were able to go fast. So, you know, back to the warehouse days where we'd be on a call with a, a prospect demoing the product and they'd come up with something great that we hadn't thought of. And I'd literally roll my chair over to the, to the two developers and say, hey, can we build this? And they'd start building it in real time. I love it. Now, obviously, we, we can't go that fast now, um, you know, through SOC compliance and, and QA. And, you know, we've got you know, 250 plus customers. You got to make sure you don't break things uh, for other customers in the process of trying to innovate. But, but we, we do still have that decision velocity of, hey, we just heard this great idea. Let's go walk down to the product group and have a quick conversation, a quick huddle. So those, those five minute meetings that you can have in person. Uh, that you know are now being re you know re replacing the 30 60 minute zoom calls that you were doing during covid uh, just gives you you know again what my coach always called is decision velocity the, the ability to really just move fast on making decisions that you know impact the business uh, at a much higher rate um, and and can you do that successfully remote absolutely i think you know the, the energy, the drive, the the culture, the the fun. You know the the competitions, all the things that we do in office, um, just are much better done if if we can come together two or three days a week, um, and and really you know move faster, and then have the two or three other days a week where you're at home or wherever you are um, working remotely, uh, being kind of heads down work. I think that that flexibility, I think, is for us at least, probably the future uh, long term. Yeah, I, I think I mean, we saw productivity actually go up, right, when everything went remote. Uh, but then it leveled off and started dipping. And, and you know, as much as people hate the commutes, there, there is something about going a place, being intentional, having those, the, the decision velocity, having those drive-bys where you can just kind of swing by somebody's desk and, and spark an right. idea. Um, but then those people that are more productive you know, by themselves, head down work, they still have that opportunity. I, I love this hybrid model that we're seeing emerge pretty much everywhere. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more, right? I think um, there are people that are fully capable of being more effective from home. Um, you know, unpopularly, probably uh, what, what my belief was is that some people, you know, probably didn't recognize that, that their performance or their actual, you know, speed and effectiveness 
was declining after two plus years of being at home five days a week and not interacting and not collaborating as much as you could. And, and some people were more aware of that than others, but I think, you know, a little push to, to have people come back in two, three days a week, um, you know, will really effectively long-term help us and help our customers be more successful. Have you had any employees that just, that grumble so much that you, you, you feel like you're, they're having to go a different direction or you're having to go a different direction? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I think, you know, if, if they listen to this, they'll, they'll know who they are. And I, and I, again, you know, it's, it's a tough position, right? I, you know, I, the leadership team and I spent a month deliberating on this decision and came to the same conclusion across the board without hesitation Mm -hmm. that we kind of kept trying to talk ourselves out of it. But, but I think for us, it, it was the right decision because we have a point in time where we really don't have a whole lot of competition in market. And, and we've just raised you know, a significant amount of capital and we've you know, grown our team rapidly um, and, and we're really needing to go faster and innovating and you know, in helping our customers be more successful. And uh, I think capturing this point in time now um, and, and maybe making some uncomfortable decisions for people um, that long term, may, maybe they'll appreciate or maybe they won't. Um, but, you know, I think there, there are some people that are going to be negatively impacted by this. But I think as a whole for the organization and for our customers, um, it, it will be a net positive to have this flexibility, but have people in the office, you know, two, three days a week. Um, and, and those people that we've impacted that I know are more upset about this, um, you know, those are conversations we'll continually have. But um, I, I think what's best for the organization is to, to have us, you know, collaborate and work faster and, and be in office at least, you know, a few days a week. But uh, it, it was certainly, you know, there, there were a couple of individuals that rightfully so were upset by it. And, and, I, and I have empathy for them. And, um, you know, what, those, what did those, those are conversations hard to see. look like? I, I'd be curious <laughs> to know. Yeah, it's it's challenging, right? Because you know you've got people that you know have have I have kids, right? Um, and you've got people that have kids at home that you know both both spouses or or, or partners work, right? And so maybe one of them has to go to the office every day already, and now you know you're asking them to come in as well, and so now you've got child care and after school care, and you know you you know those things were problems pre COVID as well, right? So my mm-hmm. my rationale and and my conversation around that is, look, you know. COVID was a point in time where we all, you know, had to adjust our lives in, in a very negative and impactful way. Um, you know, and now there's some some piece of, you know, normalizing coming back, um, right, that where we need to, you know, have some in-office uh, meetings and some in-office collaboration and, and uh, kind of start to go back to some normalcy, um, you know, and, and try to move forward, right? While, while COVID is still a thing, um, you know, we have to, we have to figure out how we can adjust, adapt and, and move forward and, and continue to be successful, not only as an organization, but as a country and as an economy and, and continually disrupting and innovating as best we can. Sure. You, you said it a couple of times, uh, you, you actually said the word empathy, but you also said a couple of times, like you're rightfully so as you're referring to how it's impacted other people's lives. And I think that's really key. And of course, there are some folks you can't get on that same page, um, but the folks that, that are on the fence and they're expressing their frustration, but you're meeting them where they are, you're giving them that empathy that you understand their perspective, and you know that it impacts them in a negative way, and you still want them to come be part of this change. Uh, I think that probably goes a long, long way. Yeah, I hope so, right? I think uh, I've always been fully transparent. One of our pieces of culture is that every Tuesday morning we, we have an all-hands meeting, bring in tacos, right, and the whole Taco Tuesday. But but the, the important part of that is we actually have a fully transparent, uh, collaborative, um, you know, all-hands-on-deck meeting. And that's where I get up and I give the state of the business and, and I put my trust in the team members on here's where we are on burn rate and fundraising and, you know, our fume date when we're going to run out of money what we're doing well and what we need to be doing better um, and, and really just put trust in, in the, the team members to have, you know, all of the confidential information that we would never make public, uh, but give them that knowledge so that they can help make better decisions to, you know, drive the organization in, in the right direction. And I think putting that trust in them, you know, hopefully makes some of these harder decisions where it makes some people uncomfortable and impacts some people more than others. 
um, makes makes them feel a little bit better about you know where they work and the team that they're on and the trust we put in them. Um, you know, while this is a disruptive decision uh, for some more than others, um, I, I think you know we've all aligned as a leadership team that it's what's best for the company. And you know, you're going to see some companies stay 100% remote, and that might be just great for them. Uh, but you're going to see a lot of companies, you know, the the, the, the the comical Elon Musk quote that he, you know, was was quoted stating a few weeks ago of, you know, I don't care where you work, um, as long as you spend a minimum of forty hours a week in the office. <laughs> so I mean, that, yeah. that's the other extreme, right? We're not we're not right. going to that yeah. level. Yeah. Yep. Now, am I to assume that you did not actually lose any employees when you <laughs> kind of brought this back out? Uh, Maybe just some upset people, but. Any, anyone say, no, I'm not doing this and, and walked out on you? It's, it's too, too early to tell. I, you know, I made some okay. uh, early assumptions that we, we would, you know, we haven't implemented this. It goes into effect in September, um, but we're already oh, wow. seeing, okay. yeah. yeah, we're already seeing a lot of people come back um, and, and a great energy from that as well and great decisions and, and, and really um, just exciting to see that uh, happening in the office, you know, even before we've kind of asked them to be back. Um, you know, so I think that being said, right, it, it's, uh, I, I fully expect to lose a handful of people and that, you know, that is probably the, the reality of making decisions like this. And, and I fully anticipate and expect that to, to be the outcome. Hopefully it's not too many and, and hopefully, you know, um, those, those are conversations that we can just have open and honest with those team members as they make that decision. But. I'll of course be fully supportive of the decision that they make and it's what's best for them and their family, right? Um, you know, and, and, and as I trust that they're understanding that the decision we made is what's best for our business uh, and it wasn't to single anyone out. Um, so those, you know, those conversations are challenging and, and again, I cannot ex express enough, you know, I do totally understand, you know, that the impact this has on some people more than others. Um, but. But again, we're a business and we, we have investors and we have customers that we're accountable to and we need to continue to execute, you know, at our highest velocity. Yeah, and, and you deliberated over the decision quite a bit. Uh, you didn't make it easily. Uh, and hopefully, you know, nobody walks away and, and you feel like they've burned a bridge and they feel like you're the bad guy, right? That You don't want that, but it doesn't sound like that's going to happen. It sounds like you guys are ha handling it with empathy and with care. Uh, and, and I love to see that. I love to hear that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. I think uh, I, I look back to March, I can't remember the day, 15 or 16, 2020, when <laughs> we held an emergency leadership meeting and uh, we, we had been in our new office that I'm sitting in now for six weeks. And we called in all hands uh, on, on Monday evening and, and uh, said, hey, we're shutting the office down. We've got to send everyone home. And, and there were moans and groans and sad faces. And because that's you know, we, we were always, you know, that in office culture and I'm not really a butts and seat guy. Uh, but, but I think that you can accomplish more w when you spend some time in person together and go faster. And I can't emphasize, I keep saying that, but that's, uh, I, I truly believe that what we do is hard and, and at an early stage company, it's, it's important to, to be able to move fast. Um, so that was a, a, a tough day for everyone. And now, you know, you fast forward almost two and a half years later and, you're getting a little bit of the opposite effect from some people, right? Like, I don't want to go back to the office. Uh, but, but I did get a lot of thank yous and a lot of, man, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're making this, you know, kind of a, a stance so that we can get some of the speed and velocity and collaboration back that we used to have. So you see a little bit from both sides. And I think the, the overwhelming reaction was positive. Good. Yeah, probably a lot of folks were almost waiting for the excuse. You know, they, they got used to working from home. They're not going to you know, opt in for a 35 minute commute on I-35, but you, you tell them to come in, they're like, oh God, okay, yes, yes, I'll come in. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think that's, that's human nature, right? I think, uh, yeah. I, I think it's, you know, they're, they're absolutely being effective from home, but you know, if somebody asks them to come in, you know, more than not, I think more than likely they're going to they're opt to come in. Um, and, and we don't make it just come in and sit, you know, sit in your desk and just heads down and do work. We, we try to do, you know, you know, lunches and collaborative working sessions and lunch and learns and breakfasts and happy hours. And we do a lot of in office things. We try to make it fun and, and, um, you know, have perks. I think those, you know, those are kind of the staples of, of startups, mm -hmm. but I think for us, it's really, you know, how can we get cross department, you know, communication and collaboration and alignment tighter? 
and that doesn't happen very well over Zoom and, and remote work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have any before we kind of move to the next part of, of the next section? Are, are there any big secrets or big tenets of your culture that you know help you guys stand out that you haven't mentioned that you want to just put out there and talk about? Man. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's probably some weird ones. I mean, we've, we've over the years come up with some slogans and, and some, um, you know, some, some phrases. I mean, be the bee is, uh, something that we've always had kind of as like a, a mantra. It originally had kind of an obnoxious, say more. sorry. Say more on that one. It stands for be the best, right? Yeah. It stands for be the best. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be transparent as I always am. The, the early mantra was created by, uh, someone that's still with us today. And, you know, he, he has, you know, big aspirations. And I think when you go into something like a startup, you should always have big aspirations. Um, but they're not just monetary, but you know, his original was be the billion, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> let's try to create a unicorn. Right. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's an okay thing to say internally, but like for us, what we're trying to do is really disrupt and create, you know, a value in a platform that didn't exist before. And an outcome, you know, of, you know, being a unicorn is just, you know, a financial outcome, but it does also drive, you know, greater velocity and, you know, innovation and investment back into the platform. But be the best is really where we landed on, you know, if everyone kind of gets behind, you know, doing every day, being the best they can in their role and helping their team members and helping our customers, then that, that really drives well. And another one is, um, change lives. We had one of our first customers, Francine, um, was, was really, uh, you know, living in a very manual world pre-source day. And she would spend from 5 p.m. to upwards of 8, 9 p.m. every evening missing kids, wow. sporting events, and otherwise just manually entering data into their ERP system. Um, and, and that's, you know, one of the small things that we do that kind of seems obvious is we automate getting those updates from suppliers back into their ERP system so that it's completely automated and, and transparent and, and, and there's no human interaction with that. So, she she told us one night that we literally changed her life and she was able to actually be home for dinner and make her kids events oh, and wow. um, so we've heard that several times since Francine and uh, so we have stickers that say change lives and be the bee and you know I think those we've gravitated towards these kind of mantras of like how can we really help change lives for our customers and and, and the individuals that use our platform not just give them a tool yeah. Yeah, having that meaning and purpose really does resonate it, when it's real. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> changing lives one uh, roof at a time. I, I mean, yeah, we need roofs on yeah. houses. But, y yeah, it, it, you actually have customers that are saying, you changed my life. Uh, and your employees get to see that. They get to hear that uh, and know that what they're doing matters. Yeah, absolutely. And that, like even today we had, you know, we, we're bringing back customer success stories in our all hands. Um, and I think that's important. Uh, I recommend all companies do this because if you look across an organization, you know, support, they only get phone calls when things aren't working, right? Support's not getting a phone call to hear about the successes of the platform and the work that they do in, in engineering, right? And in, in customer delivery, you know, they don't typically hear the, the good that we're doing. So, we have our client success team, you know, deliver a customer success story after a customer has been live for six to 12 or more months and really say what the customer does, how we've added value, what we've impacted and, and really, you know, what, what's cool about that company and what they make. Because all of our customers make physical products. You know, some of them are truly life saving, world changing products. Um, through COVID, we had organizations that were, you know, making uh, medical devices that were, you know, saving lives through COVID. Um, so, you know, a lot of very cool, uh, impactful things that we can share those stories internally and really drive more, you know, ownership and excitement around what we do every single day. I love that. That's big. Yeah. I, so I spent a few years selling uh, logistics for a, a 3PL. I won't mention their name. You can look on my LinkedIn if you want. But what I saw working for them and dealing with, I mean, a large number of my customers were, they were not big businesses. I mean, they have five to 35 employees. And just like hearing you say, yeah, they've, they're usually in some sort of a, a niche market. And as I was researching and wanting to know all about you and Source Day wanting to be prepared for this, I 
over and over again. I was like, why didn't I know about this? Like, this would have been huge. And I had this thought of like, <clears throat> dude, I could see any company that is in logistics and has a supply chain. I mean, this, this should be as common as them using, uh, you know, Google suite or Microsoft products. I mean, do y'all see yourself getting to that point where you're, you're just the, the norm in supply chain? <clears throat> And that, that'd be a dream come true, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, it seems yeah. it seems like the, the opportunity's there. Yeah, no, really, I mean, to your point, it really, I, I'm, I appreciate the, the question and the vote of confidence. You know, I think um, there's a lot of noise in supply chain technology, and I think, uh, you know, COVID, the, you know, despite the tragedy that it was, it really eliminated a lot of the education we had to do in market because we truly mm -hmm. compete against status quo. So like you said, you know, these organizations that, you know, maybe they're 50, 100 people, but they're doing a couple hundred million dollars in, in, in volume, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they're living in manual processes, Excel and email and, um, you know, it's, it's very error prone and, and just, uh, you know, painful uh, from an operation yeah. standpoint. So in scaling a business without systems and tools is, is you know, ultimately uh, impossible uh, for most part. But, you know, I think for us, you know, part of the reason we hired our CMO and, and all the amazing team members that we have is, is to be more bold and more loud about the value we drive so that more customers and more prospects can find us. And I think that's, that's the hardest thing for any, you know, new entity, new startup, new business, new ideas. You know, you've got to build that, that brand awareness. Um, and, and really for us, it was more about, we had to educate organizations that there's a better way to do business than living in Excel. Um, and that's, it's really, it's dumbed down to that. It's our customers before they use source day, 99% of them are just living in Excel sheets and, and email. Um, when we started the business, a lot of our customers that we spoke to were still faxing purchase orders to their suppliers. And this was in 2016. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, so it, it's disrupting, you know, a, a very manual, sometimes with no competition, it's harder to go to market than if you had some competition. Yeah. I feel it's very much like the, the Henry Ford thing, right? said, you know, if you ask people what they wanted, they wanted a faster horse. I mean, these people, right. you know, a lot of these <laughs> folks might go, I just need my fax machine to send this thing faster. That's it. So I do. Yeah. yeah I, I love seeing the, the disruption, but um, I want to pivot back in, into the culture, right? And being that y'all are, I mean, it is ultimately pretty niche and, and you're saying, hey, we don't really have a whole lot of competition. What, what is preventing others from, from kind of coming in and, and taking over this space or maybe even stealing some of your top talent? Yeah, absolutely. And we're seeing some of that now. You know, I think, um, you know, we, we do have a large competitor um, that, that has come to market in the last two to four years um, okay. very slowly. Uh, but they're more focused on the enterprise side. Um, so they're really, really big in the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000. Um, and, and we've really aligned ourselves to that mid-market, um, okay. call it 3 billion size, 3 billion in revenue and, and below. So it's a, a large mid-market range, but um, that's where you know the bulk of our customers and success stories come from. We have companies that are much larger, you know, $100 billion companies using Source Day, um, but our sweet spot really is in that mid-market where there's still very little competition. Now, I'd say it's not no competition. The, the challenge that we struggle with the most is um, kind of, you know, lookalikes or, you know, language and marketing content that sounds like it adds the same value, but really what, mm -hmm. it's, what it's solving is a totally different problem. But the net result is kind of a similar outcome of value, but they're going about solving a different problem to get to a similar, you know, resolution or, or pain solve. So I think, you know, for us, it's, we have a very niche, to your, to your point, uh, workflow where, where we're just helping our customers collaborate and, and, and add visibility to their suppliers and what's coming inbound and more importantly, what's not coming inbound. And it's really a network um, between buyers and their suppliers globally. Um, and, and there's a lot of companies that exist that do that for what's called indirect spend. So you're buying office expenditures like office equipment, furniture, uh, travel, uh, services, utilities, those types of things are indirect expenditures. Um, those are very different in procurement processes and in results and outcome than, say, parts and pieces that go into what you need to ship to capture revenue. 
Um, so those, those workflows that we drive are all specifically around the direct procurement of materials for their finished product. Um, so it's, you know, the, the, the competitive landscape is still very small for us. Um, there's, there's entries coming into the market in the last six months, 12 months. Uh, but that, that excites me, right? I think that shows that we're, yeah. we're onto something. There's a market and, you know, if, if, you know, there's competition coming in and entering the market that just, you know, gives us more visibility and less education that we have to do. It, it, from everything I'm seeing and, and hearing from, from you and the type of leader you are, your experience, the growth that you've had, your people and your culture actually are a differentiator. So, you know, the, your clients may only see the, the product and your, your versus competitors, but you're going to be able to continue driving better results, driving more innovation because you have the right people in the right seats and, and they enjoy what they do and they want to be the bee and, and they know that they're changing lives. And I think that's really, really special. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, I honestly, you know, I, I couldn't be sitting in this seat and, and uh, talking about any of this if it weren't for the team members that we have. And I know that's easy to say and cliche and all the all the things, but the reality is, you know, and and we really try to, you know, make make this, um, you know, known internally, and we really celebrate our victories down to the individual. Is that, you know, people are what make the difference in an organization. You know, you can have the best idea in the world and the biggest market opportunity in the world, but if you don't have the right people to execute upon it, it's going to fail every time. You might get lucky every now and then, um, but but I think. You make your own luck, right, and, and hire the right people, enable them to own and, and have ownership and, and, you know, progress to, to move the needle in their role and, and even outside their role, right, and get creative throughout the organization. So we do things like Karma. It's an app that's built into our Salesforce, and it yeah. enables peer-to-peer -peer recognition. Um, and then, you know, they can redeem that for all kinds of different things, one of them being giving to charity. Um, so you know, I think it's, it's really cool to, to see how much of that actually gets used for, you know, very real um, value added experiences where somebody went above and beyond to do something for a customer or a peer and, and not just saying, hey, great job. Here's 50 karma for doing your day job. Like we, we don't celebrate those things. Right. We want to celebrate people that are going above and beyond. Um, and I think that type of mentality of, you know, people wanting to strive for better um, and having people that, that really care, which is what everyone at Source Day does, uh, I think makes us, you know, have a huge leg up on any competitor uh, to go fast and really solve customer problems. Agreed. Agreed. Well, gosh, we talked about a lot of things here, and in the interest of time, we want to kind of jump to the next section so we're not keeping you too long. Uh, you took that predictive index behavioral assessment. It probably would have been more interesting in hindsight to have your co-founder take it, maybe even your wife take it when, you know, to compare notes. Uh, but I'm curious if, that, if what you saw about yourself resonated uh, when you read the email that came in. Or if you haven't had a chance to read the email, I can just give you some of the things that I saw. I, I did, yeah, and I just pulled it back up, the, the persuader. Uh, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There is no good or bad. It's just, yeah. it just is. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it says, you know, it, it talks about risk taking and, you know, being socially poised and, and a motivating team builder. Um, you know, I, I don't ever like to talk about myself and, you know, my, my friends probably think otherwise, but I don't, I don't like to talk about myself. And, uh, it, it, honestly, I think, you know, what we do is really challenging. Um, and, and I just strive to, to, I absolutely do, you know, hope and intend and try to motivate. Sometimes I'm probably better at that than others. Um, maybe sometimes I'm demotivating, but that's never my intent. But uh, I, I do, you know, I've I've been told at times that I've, you know, given some motivational speeches, and um, you know, whether that's intentional or not, I'm always just trying to to encourage and drive people to to do better or to push themselves harder. Um, you know. I, c continually practicing whatever it is you know that you do and, and improving and challenging yourself to to do it better or do it differently or 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 have a better outcome um is is deep in my core i was a swimmer um you know for seven years through my you know high oh, wow. through high school and um as a competitive swimmer I, I i wasn't the best um but but i always you know practiced as you know as hard as i could and um we, we you know we we had a fairly decent outcome in our high school years but 
um, I think it was just the practice and the continually trying to improve your your stroke just incrementally every single day, you know, correlates into, into business, right? You need to continually yeah. incrementally improve everything you do. Um, and I think sometimes people just need a little motivation to push themselves a little further. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, risk taking for sure. Um, I, you know, yeah. I've, I've nearly bankrupt my family building my first software company and I didn't think anything of it cause I was young and dumb. Um, but, uh, sure. yeah, I think if I hadn't done that, you know, Clinton, and I probably would have never really come together to, to create source day. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, just some of the notes that I wrote down after looking at, at your profile, driving intense, restless. I mean, you're just, you're always kind of going, uh, quick to connect. And I think that's one of the things that makes you motivating. You, you are going to trust quickly and easily and people are also going to trust you quickly and easily. Um, competitive is one of the things I wrote down. Uh, sounds like yeah. that's been part of your story. To a fault. And then, uh, yeah. yeah, to a fault. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, this has been really fun. I, I want to give you a chance to plug anything that you're working on. You, you mentioned that you're going to have a podcast uh, coming soon. Is that something you want to plug or what else comes to mind that you want to get out there? Yeah, no, I think, uh, so we're announcing a podcast, um, called what the duck it's about supply chain. Um, uh -huh. the long story behind the duck, but it's something that we, we ship out to all of our partners and referral, uh, you know, Alliance partnerships. Uh, and it has some, some source day, um, questions and kind of qualifying type comments on it that, that we send out. And it's actually, uh, shockingly and as silly as it sounds, that's actually brought us, you know, many dozen close one opportunities just by reminding customers, pro I mean, reminding yeah. prospects. Um, so what the duck is a podcast we're, we're launching. It's going to be completely and entirely about supply chain and procurement of direct materials, which sounds really incredibly boring, <laughs> but I, I guarantee you it's going to be exciting. Sarah, everything she, you know, seems to touch and, and create, um, she makes it exciting and she makes it engaging and, uh, we're going to have a, a great list of speakers. And, um, you know, I know, as you know, right, putting a podcast together is a, is a big investment in time and resources. Um, mm -hmm. so we're excited about that. And I think, you know, it'll be one of the only, I think, specific direct material supply chain podcasts to exist, whether that's a good thing or not. But, uh, you know, I think what we do was a very unsexy market and industry. And then, you know, COVID put a lot of eyes and awareness on how fragile our supply chains are and, and really what that can do to, you know, the luxuries in life, but more importantly, the things that we need in life, like toilet paper and, uh, you know, ventilators and medical devices, you know, all of those things where we're trying to real pain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I'll plug that our podcast, uh, it will launch later awesome. in August. What the duck coming nice. in August. Have y'all already been doing recording episodes? She has started recording. Um, I think some, some like test trial runs and I think she's formally recording her first episode this week. Oh, nice. awesome. Very cool. Well, we'll be excited to check that out as well. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So we're going to, we're going to end off with, or was there anything else you wanted to plug? Um, follow us on LinkedIn. Um, as, as I've said, yeah. our, our CMO has incredibly engaging and fun and sometimes uh, comical content that uh, I think, you know, even if you're not a customer or a prospect, you know, maybe you'll get some good nuggets out of it. But you can follow Sarah Scudder or Source Day uh, on LinkedIn. I can say I laughed, especially there was, she posted something pretty recent about ordering a, a dining room table and chairs yep. and and the only thing that came was the chairs and oh, so, yeah. yeah it's definitely looking going okay this is not what <laughs> normal but i don't really do normal myself so see I'm a big fan of that and yeah, we're humanizing the uh the supply chain problem she's moving in uh to austin from san francisco and she's oh, struggling wow. i don't think she has a couch or, or furniture still so i don't i don't know <laughs> yep that struggle's real yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the, 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 like it's come to our awareness. Yeah. Before COVID, I don't know that the everyday person had ever uttered the words supply chain in their lives. No. And now it's something that everyone knows what that means and that it's not just the world doesn't just run by itself. We don't just yeah, get the things we need magically. Yeah. 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 Well, that's going to be now awesome. You, what the duck following source day on LinkedIn. I love it. Wonderful. 
All right, so we're going to end off with a quick fire. It's kind of a this or that. So I'm just going to say a couple of different words, and you got to choose without thinking. Just tell me the words that come to mind, your preference. All right, so hard copy or audio book? Audio. Spend money or save money? Spend. <laughs> Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars. Nice. <laughs> Queso or guacamole? Queso, come on. <laughs> <laughs> the last one, television series or movie? Oh, jeez. Television series. <laughs> Those are good. Nice. I, any, it, no, I was was say, I watched any, any favorite? Uh, oh, go ahead. Any, any favorite t- TV series you've watched lately? And there's, yeah, the, the, the old man, uh, I don't know if you watched that. I think it's on Hulu. Um, okay. pretty, pretty good. Um, and then, and the, and the ones that were on, um, Uber and, uh, um, we work, those, we those were great. Yeah. Yeah. The, Hit a little yeah, close to we, home. We crashed. Yeah. We crashed. Yeah. It's, it's wild that I almost took an opportunity as a director of operations at WeWork here in Austin right yeah. before all that blew up a few Oof. years ago. So it's kind of wild to see <laughs> that stuff now. Okay, congrats on your good decision. No <laughs> Man, it was What's awesome on? talking to you. We, we got some gold here. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and go. Again, if you don't mind, like keep the tab up. Let it upload yeah. once I stop the recording. Uh, and then we'll get the original. It'll be really good quality when we, when we post this thing. So um, you were awesome. Uh, love yeah. to see what you guys are up to right now. Thanks so much, Tom. Oh. Have a great rest of your day. You too. I appreciate the opportunity. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're signing off. We'll catch Thanks, you later. Thanks, guys. See you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.